All right. We said we were going to have a palate cleanser and watch and review a classic wrestling program. And I thought, just because it's something I wanted to watch again, as I mentioned, I hadn't watched it all the way through in years and years and years. The first Clash of Champions on TBS, well, in March 27, 1988, um, from Greensboro at the Greensboro Coliseum. I have a lot of people always, you know, write and ask me, well, I'm just starting to get into the older wrestling. You know, I wasn't around for it the first time. What should I watch? What should I do? <clears throat> I got a Clash 1 is a really good uh, NWA big show to watch if you're just starting to get into the real TBS era. Uh, obviously, Crockett had had big show Starcade dated back to 83. The first closed circuit broadcast of Starcade was Starcade 85. So it done 85, 86, and 87. The, the NWA had done live big shows, um, but had and had just started trying to dip their foot in pay per view, which is how TBS started getting involved. But we had never done a live TV special. Even the superstars on the Superstation back in 86 had been taped at the Omni on a Sunday night and then aired the following Friday on TBS. But this was live TV, and it was there to counter-program WrestleMania that year. And we've talked about this show in deep dives of the Crockett business at the time, and we've talked about it in terms of the wars between... Uh, the WWF and, and the NWA over getting on pay-per-view and Vince trying to block Crockett and all that stuff, but we've never just reviewed it as a show. And even it wasn't, and for the reasons we'll talk about, it wasn't the greatest performance that every NWA star put on ever in one night. There wasn't time for that. <clears throat> but there was a couple of very memorable things and and just some stuff now watching it with today's eyes that, People can go back and, and see you don't see any more from anybody. So I thought we would go through these matches and we're going to save the Midnight and Fantastics match for last because we're going to do a little watch along. Like it's only 12 minutes and something where we we watch it and we talk about it. And that way you can go to the network. We're giving Vince is getting nine bucks from all of us these days and you can watch it with the inside commentary going on but anyway um i wish this honestly the you know once again i wish so many of the shows that the house shows that had these really long and classic matches and these big crowds were available to watch like this because now people go back and there's the greensboro coliseum it's march of 88 it's live tv but there's only five or six thousand people there and i say only that was bad for greensboro and this was at a time when we ran Greensboro every couple or three weeks, if not at least once a month. But Brian, try to help me explain the difference in those days versus now. We were surprised we had five or 6,000 people because it was on TV for free. Why would anybody go? There were 12 to 15 live wrestling events in the Greensboro Coliseum with all these stars per year. This is the one they can stay home, not have to buy a ticket, not have to park, blah, 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 and still see for free, and they still came. But now, the way people look at wrestling since it's changed is like, well, they should have been sold out because it was a big show. It didn't work that way then. It didn't make any sense to go watch something live and pay for it when you could see it on TV for free. Have I covered that properly? I think so. And of you course, know, it, George Scott didn't promote that Superdome show a year later. Well, the, yeah, there was all kinds of reasons why that fucking thing wasn't seen by anybody. But in this case, this was the first one. It was brand new. So we knew going in that there was going to be nobody in Greensboro. But I'd love to see some of those. That place, when there, when there was 16,000 people in that place, it was fucking cool. Anyway, um, Tony Schiavone, Bob Caudill, and Jim Ross, our announced team. This was when JR was in his prime of being able to call wrestling as a sport. Going back and listening to Tony now, then, he had excitement. He was calling the matches. He had oomph. He was, he was still in wrestling in his head. And that's the way I remember hearing him. And now when I hear him just kind of verbally shaking his head, what's going on, and kind of laughing like, wow, it's crazy now, folks. He's not into wrestling in his head now. He doesn't know what the fuck he's looking at in front of him. 
And he's just, he's trying to figure out a way to describe it like he used, because he was a baseball announcer. He was a sports announcer. You can't do that, call this shit today like a sport. He was so much better then. And that's why people remember him fondly. Um, the ring announcer was Tom Miller. The best. I love Dr. Tom Miller. He's my favorite. And Tom Miller was the Greensboro ring announcer. He was like six foot six. He was huge. He towered over everybody and all, and he had the old time boxing ring announcer's voice. But the first time I was in Greensboro, they never clued him in that I was going to do the introduction. And he started trying to introduce us. And I went over to grab the microphone from him and he didn't want to give it to me. We had a tug of war. I was with a giant ring announcer. I'm trying to take the microphone away. He he had the great voice, and if he did did it like he was used to doing it, he was fine. But in this case, he had to re read the rules of this gimmick match they had between Jimmy Garvin and and Mike Rotunda for the World TV title. It was three five minute rounds and a one count pin, and everybody saying what the fuck. Part of this came up as. Rotunda obviously is in Kevin Sullivan's varsity club. He's an amateur wrestler. Everybody knew that Mike Rotunda was a real good hotshot amateur wrestler. Jimmy Garvin has switched babyface the previous year. He's he and Precious are being targeted by Kevin Sullivan. So Garvin's going to wrestle this hotshot amateur. And Jimmy Garvin, unbeknownst to people, was actually a pretty good state amateur in Florida years ago. <clears throat> but anyway, they were they did very little amateur wrestling, but that was the rules by, or the reason behind these rules. And Teddy Long was the referee. And they didn't have much time on this show. Nobody had a lot of time on this show because the main event was going Broadway. But they at the same time, everybody, the angles, the fans knew what was going on. They knew why everybody was mad so they could get right into things. And by the way, just for comparison, we talked about ratings a minute ago. Well, this was on TBS on a Sunday afternoon. I can't remember what time it started. Was it, Brian, was it a two or three o'clock or whatever the fuck? Or did they do the five o'clock that year? I forget what time. Whatever. A Sunday afternoon on TBS, which at this time was available in 40 million homes, which is approximately a, a third, well, a, a little over a third. They're available in what, about a 90 or 100 million now? Anyway, available in 40 million homes. The show did a 5.8 rating and a 13 share. That's cable ratings. Cable ratings were different than network in those days because of the disparity in the available homes. 5.8, 13 share, 4 million viewers on a network available in 40 million homes. By contrast, both AEW and NXT on Wednesday night, did less than a million on networks available in between 90 and 100 million homes. The Sting and Flair match on this clash peaked at a 7.8 rating and a 15 share with over 5 million viewers. It was the most watched pro wrestling match in cable TV history. It was the most watched pro wrestling match in America since the... Uh, that was that uh, the the Saturday Night Live Saturday Night Live Saturday Night's main event era the, the Friday Night event with Hogan Andre was a few months before this it was a few okay it was it was the most watched of all since that Hogan and Andre thing which was the most watched match since the network TV days of the fifties and this record for Sting and Flair lasted until the Attitude Era ten years later so. <clears throat> you know, golly, I'm sorry that uh, their 750,000 viewers or 500,000 viewers or whatever doesn't impress me like it impresses everybody else. This is why. Anyway, Jimmy Garvin and Rotunda, they had a, did a five-minute round where they had a wrestling match. There was some heat between them. Fucking tempers flared. Jimmy Garvin shined. Rotunda got a cheap shot in at four minutes or so, and Garvin sold. And finally, at the end of the first round, the people were going crazy for Rotunda, Rotunda trying to turn him to get a one-count pin. And the bell rang. Rest period. Next round, Rotunda continues the heat. All of a sudden, the crowd fucking blows for Jimmy Garvin, slamming Mike Rotunda off the top rope and making his comeback. Boom, boom, boom. 
They did a little distraction with Kevin Sullivan and Precious. Sullivan tries to interfere. Precious hangs on his ankle. And when Jimmy Garvin laid his hands on fucking Kevin Sullivan, the people lost their shit. And as soon as he does that, just nails him a time or two. Rotunda gets a roll up and a one count. The heel wins. Boom. Rick Steiner comes in, the third member of the varsity club. And the heels start getting heat on Jimmy Garvin until Precious grabs the fucking two before that Steiner had brought in and fucking hits Rick Steiner with a two before and then grabs Kevin Sullivan's coat hanger and puts it around his neck and the people absolutely lost their minds. This whole thing, entrances and everything, fucking nine minutes and they were out of there. And the people were going crazy. And nothing was stupid or insulting and they got the point across. And they're working every night in house shows all across the country, so they left with some heat on the heels to continue those matches. Nice opening segment. Yeah. Imagine that. Instead of fucking giving away shit that you're you're gonna fucking try to charge people for between people that don't know how to do it. Mike Rotunda, his run from like nineteen eighty eight till the summer of eighty nine is so great. I've never liked anything with him as much as I like Varsity Club Mike Rotunda. Not to put IRS down or Michael Wall Street or Mike Rotundo, <laughs> but him in that Syracuse singlet worked with that haircut and just, he looks like the preppy jock that you want to see get their ass kicked. And he was so smug. And the Varsity Club was one of the few highlights of 1988 NWA. Those promos with Sullivan. And then you had the dynamic between Rotunda and. Steiner eventually leading to them wrestling each other, but Mike Rotunda, 1988 Mike Rotunda is so great. Well, and it, it, because it was the most real life of him, an amateur shooter that was, and he, I'm not saying he was a smug prick, but he was an amateur shooter that could have that little smirk on his face. And then he's, he's the straightest looking guy in the room next to Steiner, who was a maniac and Sullivan, who's a lunatic. And it just, it, it was a nice combination. It played off everybody well. Um, then Bob Caudle introduced, inter introduced, interviewed Dr. Death Steve Williams, who had just obviously come over a few months earlier from the remnants of the UWF. And <laughs> did you notice Dr. Death was Scott Steiner 15 years earlier? That's a nice way of putting it. This, Actually, 20 years, 20 years earlier. This is not a good... <laughs> oh no, no. It, it was awful. a dr death promo yeah. he made absolute they gave him for whatever reason too much time and uh, so, some of these interview segments you'll see they're standalone segments because on live tv they didn't go to commercial break during any of these matches including the 45 minutes that flair and sting went the commercial breaks like a real sporting event came in between. So to have enough segments, to have enough breaks, they'd come back for a short segment, like an interview like this, and then go right back to break and then come back and have a full length match. But anyway, no doc couldn't talk. And if he was a fired up heel with an issue, or if he was a fired up baby face with an issue in mid South, especially where he, you know, had Watts hands on with him, it was okay. But no, just a, bland promo about all the things he was going to do. It made no sense. It was Scott Steiner 20 years before Steiner started doing math and it, you know, didn't do him any favors. Then we come to the U S tag team title match, which we're going to save till the end because we're going to set that up and talk about it and then, and do the watch along. But basically, uh, it was a five match card and, and we had to be on second because then we had to have uh, Dusty and the Road Warriors. We had to have the World Tag Title. And we had to have the World Heavyweight Title. So we got a pretty, you know, virgin crowd out of it. But as we will make most of it, as we'll talk about here later on, um, we'll skip ahead for that now. So, and you can save your thoughts also. But I don't know why this placement of this, but we, <laughs> the way they placed this was. The interview with me and Ken Osmond came after I'd already been out there beating the piss out of there. I know it was pre-taped, but still, you would have thought they'd wanted to leave us with a little heat. But then instead, here I come with Ken Osmond. But have, have, I, have I ever told you the story of me meeting Eddie Haskell? You haven't, but let me just clarify here. 
Ken Osmond was the actor that played Eddie Haskell, one of the great heels in the history of television. Yes. You didn't do an interview with Ken Osmond. It was presented as you doing an interview with Eddie Haskell. Well, yeah, but here's the thing. Nobody knew this was going to fucking happen until we all showed up. TBS had helped the, the uh, obviously they're giving us two and a half hours of television time on a Sunday opposite WrestleMania. They built the opening graphics and, and they tried to present this show like a big time sporting event. And this was the first time they were really going to publicly acknowledge that they're really behind their wrestling program. At the same time, one of the very few original television shows being produced by TBS was the new leave it to beaver. And Ken Osmond was reprising his role uh, as Eddie Haskell. And, oh, thank you, Mrs. Cleaver. You know, the the I've, I guess there's people out there that have never watched Leave it to Beaver now, but Eddie Haskell was the juvenile delinquent friend of uh, Beaver's brother, Wally, who was always trying to get everybody in trouble, but whenever he was around an authority figure, like a mother or a parent or a teacher, he was so polite and, oh, hello, Mrs. Cleaver. He was full of shit, right? <laughs> so they <clears throat> they send Eddie Haskell, Ken Osmond, to Greensboro for this big live television show that they're doing for the wrestling, and they want to promote their other show, the new Leave It to Beaver. And the only idea they had was that when Ken Osmond shows up, Eddie Haskell is going to have an interview with Jim Cornette. And that's it. They didn't fucking tell us anything. when I got there. They said, oh, we're going to do this. I'm like, okay. And I'm waiting for somebody to say, what are we supposed to be doing? And nobody knew. And finally, Ken Osmond comes over and says, hey, let's, let's figure something out. So we went over 10 minutes before we shot this thing in one take. We went out, uh, out back of the Greensboro Coliseum and said, okay, we see why they're doing this because I'm the mama's boy. He's the fucking, you know, prick teenager, you know, asshole, heelish uh, people. So we just came up with some shit to, to say to each other that would work Eddie Haskell's gimmick and Jim Cornette's gimmick. And everybody's like, oh, Cornette, you hate celebrities in, this, in the business. Well, I wouldn't have picked to do this if it had been me, but since we're doing it, this worked because it didn't make any of the boys look stupid. And it actually didn't even expose fucking Leave it to Beaver's business because Eddie Haskell was in gimmick. And it was... It, it, Bob Caudill, who I guarantee you, as Jim Ross once called him, the epitome of a white man wearing brown shoes. I don't even know if he watched Leave it to Beaver first run, but he introduced Eddie Haskell like Eddie Haskell was the, the actor and the star of the show because he didn't know the difference. So Ken Osmond was referred to by a few people as Ken Osmond, but he was really being Eddie Haskell and not breaking kayfabe. And he was talking to me about my rich mother, and I was talking to him about his fucking letter jacket at Mayfield. And people had to either think, either Cornette's such a fucking idiot, he thinks that guy really is a dick, or really is Eddie Haskell. Or they might have thought, well, we don't know, both these pricks are just trying to fucking get over at each other's expense. But we didn't do anything to make the wrestling business look stupid or phony. And Eddie Haskell did not offer to take any bumps. Not to be lost in the shuffle, Vern Gagne brought Lumpy Rutherford in for an angle on AWA TV. <laughs> That's super clash. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yes, so the, I I was had a face to face with Eddie Haskell on TBS. What do you prefer, your uh, face to face with Eddie Haskell, or your face to face with Grandpa Munster? Well, I no, I'm hot about that because I got Eddie Haskell in person. Grandpa Munster wasn't even there. We, me and Michael Hayes, did our fucking pre tapes and. And they edited it in. I didn't get to meet Grandpa Munster. What a shame. Anyway, they they did an interview with Gary Hart and Al Perez. Gary Hart was great, as usual. Al Perez was nothing special and not great and shows again why that he was insane when he had thought he should be the world champion. Hey, can I ask you a question? Sure. When I watched this, it popped up in my mind. If Al Perez doesn't leave under the circumstances for which he left, which I think were he didn't want to put Ric Flair over in Miami, does Gary Hart get Muda? Uh, I'm sure he would have. Yes, I'm sure he would have. Because not only 
It's not like, as we saw with the varsity club, they weren't limited or later on when Gary had Muda and Dragon Master and Terry Funk, they wouldn't limit the guy to just one member of a stable. And Muda was perfect for Gary because of the Kabuki uh, connection. And Gary always liked the foreign menaces that didn't speak, that he could create the mysterious backstories around, etc. So anyway, did you notice that then it was time the Crockett Cup was going to take place less than a month after this, 88 Crockett Cup. And it was time for the seedings to be announced, and it was announced on the big television special, Bob Caudle pitched to Francis Cockett. <laughs> Francis Cockett, who was dressed in a ball gown with dangly earrings that if they'd have been real would have cost six million dollars um and she gave the Crockett Cup seeds and I think she ran Linda McMahon a real good run for her money for the worst promotion family res television personality awful Cheap graphics, horrible delivery, monotone, deer in the headlights stand. I'm not even knocking Francis. They shouldn't have done this. They kept doing it, and they shouldn't have done it. And I'm going to make some more references here before we're done with this show, but this was what doomed the NWA and later WCW to be viewed as second class to the WWF in the wars because a Crockett was running out of a converted convenience store on fucking you know, Briar Ben Drive in Charlotte with the same three accountants and secretaries he'd had since the fucking 50s. And Vince was building a big company. And Crockett was putting family members on. Even if it, the Crockett Cup was named after his father, that doesn't mean a family member had to legitimately be a television personality to announce it every year. And Vince got Muhammad Ali and Liberace. And later on, we end up with Jason Hervey and Ken Osmond. So it wasn't the wrestling product, the booking, or the talent. It was the perception by these awful visuals. Anyway, then the big barbed wire match. And Dusty loved to gimmick the big shows, even when he only had five minutes, five matches to work on. But six-man barbed wire match, Road Warriors and Dusty Rhodes with Paul Ellering against Powers of Pain, the Barbarian and Warlord, with Uncle Ivan Koloff and Paul Jones. And they had done and referred to the bench press angle where the powers of pain in Greensboro month or two before had beat to piss out of the road warriors and hit animal in the face with the weightlifting plate and animals wearing the fucking hockey face mask as the protector. Cause he's got the broken eye sock. And I don't know why they put the barbed wire in. Cause they were <laughs> several times <laughs> Like right at the start, Animal just dropped down and slid right out under the fucking ropes to chase Paul Jones and kill the barbed wire. <clears throat> but it was, you know, it's it's a gimmick. If they put a hat on a hat here too back in the 80s, folks. Um, Ivan Koloff was the oldest guy and he was taking all the bumps, including a big press slam off a of fucking Animal. This was a six-way, what we used to call a meat chopper, just chop meat brawl. Uh, milk the barbed wire. Ivan and Dusty got some fucking color, but not much. And the announcers never referenced blood because they were still treading lightly with TBS and whether they would accept it or not. But the people were insane for everything they did because of the, the story. The, the story behind this was such that there was no story to this match. There's six guys in the whole way for five or six minutes with barbed wire wrapped around the ropes and everybody's just chopping meat and punching and kicking each other. And every once in a while, Animal will get a big press slam or Dusty will get the big fucking flip flop and fly in the elbow. And the people will come absolutely fucking unglued. And then finally, Barbarian comes off the top with a diving headbutt. But who was it? Dusty moved and he hit Barbarian hit Warlord. Boom, one, two, three. Five-minute match, out, done. The people are screaming, but then the heels turn around and get some heat again because of the house show matches that they've still got to do. And they take Animal's mask off and try to fuck up his bad, bad eye long enough until Dusty and Hawk make the save and the people cream their jeans again. That was what that was, and that's what it was supposed to be. On the WWE Network version, they have the original music still because this is when Crockett started 
getting his own music as opposed to using commercial music. But they all came out to Dusty Rhodes' music instead of the Road Warriors' music. Well, that's because the Road Warriors at the time were still using Iron Man. But Dusty had gotten... What was it that he got? I fucking forgot the goddamn music he was using there because I skipped the entrance on this one. I don't remember the name of the song. I just know how it's... The point is, it was his his own. It wasn't like Ozzy Osbourne. Um, Anyway, the next promo for the short segment was Nikita Koloff. And boy, here you see another problem. Nikita Koloff, the Russian nightmare, the way that Dusty brought him in and introduced him as the nephew of Ivan Koloff, the the man who would have been the Olympic champion if fucking the Russian, you know, the Olympics hadn't been boycotted in 1984, the evil... Dolph Lundgren fucking ripoff from the Rocky Four movie, um, I- impervious to pain, three hundred pounds, that goddamn jacked up body, bald head. That w- for two years, what a fucking run that was, right? He was over incredible, out of nowhere to main event Charlotte in front of twenty five or thirty, almost thirty thousand people with Ric Flair after being in the business for what a year and a half. By March of 88, he's become a baby face. <laughs> he's out there in a suit. He's still trying to do a Russian promo, but now he's he's trying to be a nice Russian. Instead of just, if he dies, he dies. You tell him. He's fucking talking a mile a minute. He's anti-drug. He's a cosmopolitan Russian. He's wearing a suit. He's got a nice haircut. He's telling the people he's he's talking to the kids against drugs. This was when he first started finding religion. His his wife was ill at the time. I'm not making any fun of that. This interview went forever, and this interview is also why Nikita Koloff was one of the biggest box office attractions in the business in his rookie year and never again. Because this Nikita Koloff was not going to fucking fly. Not unless he was the host of the Russian version of Dancing with the Stars. I have to admit, I was impressed. It went... A long time, this interview. And I didn't even know what he was talking about by the end of it. But he had that voice going the whole time. And you try to do that. You try to rock it. It's hard to do that for a minute yeah. straight. I don't know how he didn't kill his voice. Hey, well, he used to use it on the plane. I told you that. He he got so into making sure that nobody saw through him when 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 he was on top. That when Crockett first got his plane and it was just us, the boys riding on it, he was talking to the boys on the plane in the fucking accent until Arn said, cue ball, cut the fucking accent. We know you're Scotty Simpson from Minnesota. Anyway, we follow that with the world tag team title match, Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson with J.J. Dillon against the challengers, Barry Windham and Lex Luger. Another tag team, and by the way, everything so far on the card has been completely different from all the other matches. This was no exception. They got some time to settle in and have a little tag match here, even though it was shorter than most NWA matches. This match in the arena would have gone 20 or 25 minutes. Well, they didn't have that time on television, but once again, it was ready-made. These heels were so good that all the baby faces had to do was clothesline and pose. And But even then, I mean, Barry Wyndham was one of the best workers in the world. Lex Luger, for all the criticism he got back then, and everybody knocking him, and, oh, come on, you know, package, he's so green. He looks like the best wrestler in the world with today's eyes when you don't see anybody with that size and that body that's doing those fucking power slams, and his shit looked good now compared to what we see today. Let me tell you something. I know it was a popular thing in the sheets, how awful Lex Luger was. But Lex Luger from 1988 to 1990 is fantastic. Yeah. As a babyface or a heel. He was really fantastic as a heel in 89, but he's great. And you watch this, like you said, you watch it after seeing all the shit we've seen the last several years. Considering he'd only been in the business, what, three years by this point in time? Uh, not, no, not that long. Not full time. Two and a half years, let's Probably. say. Probably, Yeah. He's really good here. I mean, I know it's a popular thing to say Lex Luger sucks and he always sucked. It's just not true. <laughs> anyway, um, the baby faces bumped 
Arn and Tully around for a second, and then they started heat on Luger within the first minute of the match and got just a touch of steam on him so that they could give BW a hot tag. And because Barry was so smooth, he's come back, the great sleeper spot with Tully where he snags the sleeper and Tully tries to go through the ropes and he holds on to it and they're out on the floor with the sleeper. Um, they teased a little false heat there just so that they could give Barry a comeback because he was so good at it. But they, at the same time, they wanted Barry to be the guy to sell because he was so much better at that than Lex. And then Lex got the final comeback anyway. Uh, JJ does a distraction spot and they get some heat on Barry and they, they were sprinting through this at a pay, a faster pace than they would have normally worked a house show match. <clears throat> because you want things to register, but at the same time, nobody made any mistakes and everybody was still with it. They didn't run off and leave people. And the crowd by five minutes into the match was fucking molten. And then uh, Tully and BW did the perfect double knockout. If anybody wants to go back and watch that, it's 53 minutes and 45 seconds on the counter into this program. If you want to see how to do a double knockout, the way it's supposed to be done, the way it doesn't look planned, the way everybody just doesn't run into each other and fall down for no reason like they're supposed to, Tully Blanchard and Barry Windham did it perfectly. On the fly, looked good, blindside, boom. And then they go down, and then as they get hooked back up, they do the double bridge spot with Barry Windham at six fucking six and 260. And having, they've been working that fucking hard and that quick, and then they do the, you know, the double bridge spot like Flair and Steamboat or Flair and all his favorite opponents used to do. <clears throat> Headlock, hip lock, head scissors, fucking get up into the fucking reverse 69 position, double bridge up, and then fucking BW goes right into a side salto. And then when finally Tully stops BW, hits him with the slingshot suplex, one, two, BW powers a shoulder out and the crowd goes ballistic because somebody kicked out of the slingshot suplex. Holy shit. Finally, Barry makes his hot tag and now here comes Lex's big comeback. This is the final one and it's huge and they feed for him. And then as they get into the four-way without umpteen false finishes back and forth because that would have been great if this was another match, but this match didn't need it. They didn't have time for it. They just told the fucking story. Come back four way. JJ puts a chair in the corner and Arn tries to fucking run Luger into it, but Luger foils him and shovels him off. Head first, Arn into the chair. One, two, three, huge pop, new world tag team champions. And the people give him a fucking standing ovation. <clears throat> Especially after they'd done the deal in the Midnight Fantastics match that we'll talk about in a minute, where the people thought they'd seen a title change and popped on it, and then they didn't get it. But they still bought this one because there wasn't two referees and they could see what had happened now. They weren't going to get fooled again. And what the fuck? Were they, were they out there, entrances and everything, 15 minutes? And it tore the fucking house down. Do you think Dusty already knew he was going to turn Barry heel? Uh, probably. Probably, because when was that at this point? That has to be within a month, two months after this, I think. Yeah, so it, basically, well, because Luger had split off from the horseman uh, in the, you know, the previous year. Because Barry's healed so, by the time you get the Crockett Cup, I think, isn't he? I th Yes, that's what they did. The, they did the switch and vacated the, but the point is, Luger had switched and got away from the horsemen the previous year. So out of the two of them, Luger had the involvement with the horsemen. So it would, people would probably think if anybody was going to betray the new, the new tag team champions, it would be the ex horseman, which is why he switched the other guy. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, they, you know, and that also Tully and, and Arn were going into the, Crockett Cup is the number one seed, so now suddenly they're not the champions anymore. Or there's some controversy going on, but anyway, it, it it just and it's ref and also it's not only refreshing to see uh a n more tag team work like that, but boy, Tully and Arn look, uh, or I should say, FTR 
put me such in mind of Tully and Arn yeah. physically and, and just their work and just the everything on point, the little things and et cetera. But, but yeah, I, great tag team match. That's unheralded there that nobody remembers that match off this show. They don't talk about it. That's because these guys were that good every night. It, it didn't stand out at the time. Anyway, which just leaves the big one, right? And this was, once again, a tale of the in-ring being so outstanding and untouchable and everything else about TBS and Crockett's foray into national wrestling looking minor league. <laughs> they got the NWA World Heavyweight Championship on the line. Ric Flair defending against Sting, Sting's first big match. And this is wild. That, and by the way, I can't remember when it was, but within a few months, I think beforehand, Flair and Wyndham had actually drawn 16,000 people to Greensboro for the world title match. 130 something thousand dollar house. Sting had never had a big main event match like this. That's why they didn't want to give away Flair and Wyndham or Flair and Luger. So for the main event, they said, well, let's, let's give Sting a shot at the title, but it's not giving away a big marquee match. What it did was make Sting's career because Flair loved the guy. As far as his athleticism, his look, his personality, the way the people were starting to get with him, he wanted to make him. So he's, he was all on board with this. And this ended up being not only the match of the year that year with all the voting and everything, but also the most important match probably that TBS broadcast in the their early years of wrestling involvement because it's what made Sting really a star on the level with Wyndham and Luger and Flair and the Horsemen and all those guys. He wasn't then. People don't remember that now because they aren't old enough to have been fans before Sting was a big star. <clears throat> so they've got this match, but <sighs> to acquiesce to showbiz involvement to TBS to the new TV partner, whatever they're going to go. They've got to shoehorn the celebrities in some kind of way. And they always intended to have a Broadway on this. They didn't want to beat sting, but at the same time they didn't want to fucking, you know, do anything screwy. So they always thought they'd go Broadway. So they decided to have judges. The judges were Baltimore promoter, Gary Juster, my old friend, gutless Gary, who, <laughs> nobody he wasn't like uh, the promoter on television they just announced he was the baltimore promoter so he sounded like he knew what he was doing wrestling legend sandy scott who everybody in the carolinas knew and nobody else you know knew anymore because he'd been retired for 20 fucking years penthouse pet patty mullen yeah and flair got to do the promo saying well i know who she's going to be voting for he was right and then here's the problem. They also announced Ken Osmond slash Eddie Haskell. And for whatever reason, I don't know whether that's when Jason Hervey had just started. No, he wasn't fucking Missy yet. He wasn't even of age yet. No, and Missy wasn't even there. Missy wasn't Missy wasn't even there. It was Owen. Missy wasn't even there. <laughs> but Jason Hervey, another, the, he was on what? The Wonder Years at that point. And an actor, and he shows up, and he's hanging around. That's how he, he's a wrestling fan, but he's a TV star, so they put him on, and that's how he met Missy and ended up fucking around with Missy, was being at all these wrestling shows. But they announced them at ringside, too, even though they weren't judges, and they sat at the judges' table, so there's five judges, but only three of them got a vote. I think I'd have rather had Eddie Haskell's word over the penthouse pet. Do you remember what movie she starred in? What classic? I, I do not. It used to be on TV all the time. I don't think it'll be on any TV network anytime soon. She was the star of the classic Frankenhooker. Do you remember Frankenhooker? I remember that now, Frankenhooker. They put a hooker together from parts, right? Yeah, well, the guy, he concocts like this form of crack cocaine where if you smoke it, you explode. <laughs> and he gets a whole bunch of hookers back to his hotel room because his girlfriend had died, but he has her head and he needs to reconstruct her. And then he decides he doesn't want to do it. He can't do this, but the hookers find the drugs and they start smoking it. Like they're Jake, the snake Roberts. And they all just blow up. And then he has the parts to put Frank and hooker who is played by Patty Mullen together. I wonder if she's like the other pets. 
the penthouse pets were all escorts. <sighs> Get your mind out of the gutter. No, it's a fact. They were. I, used to- I do not. I do not like. I'm a prude. I do not like sex talk. <laughs> Intimate relations should be between one man and one woman with as small a crowd as possible watching. I think what I said fit into those guidelines. Anyway, um, Frankenhooker, Frankenhooker now on DVD. (laughs) So, and JJ Dillon, by the way, uh, Flair's manager was hung in a small cage over the dusty loved gimmick and everything. Uh, but but once again, once the bell rings, this was the only long match so they could take their time. Sting was still huge, but he was so athletic, and this stood out as a match for the world title. Uh, you got the impression it was important, even with all the goofy judges and everything, the way that the referee and the guys in the ring treated it, the way that the announcers spoke about it. It's an athletic contest for something, for something that's important. And the people in the building, they were blowing when Sting would reverse Flair's top wrist lock. They, oh! And this was an old-fashioned, the bones of an old-fashioned NWA World Championship match with a modern 80s Flair spin on it. It was paced and built slow from the start so it could continue to unfold and lead to making the challenger look like a star. The spots built and paid off, but then Rick would slow it back down because he knew that they had time to fucking put in. Um, I mentioned here, this is where I noted that the announcing, Tony Schiavone had so much more energy and seemed so much more genuine. He didn't sound like he was either just shaking his head like, what the fuck am I looking at or how can I call this? It's not that he's trying to make fun of anything even now, but he just doesn't know what he's looking at. Can I say, though, I think... yeah because I like their work in the future, I personally would have preferred Jim Ross and Bob Cottle doing the match. I thought Bob Cottle yeah. added a lot. They were folksy. They were folksy with each other. Yeah, well, I just had a three-man booth. I, JR and Tony had been fine. JR and Bob were really well smoothed together. I think there was always some... There was, there was a little tension between JR and Tony because they were both at one time... Tony was the lead guy till JR showed up, and then JR was the lead guy, but Tony was the second guy. Bob didn't care. Not that he didn't care. He always worked hard, but he didn't care whether he was the lead dog or the last dog, as long as, you know, he was just there to do what he was supposed to do. Um, but all through this, Sting was green and he wasn't smooth, but he did everything that Flair called. Even if it wasn't pretty, I guarantee you, Ric Flair never called Sting to do another flying head scissors after he they almost got killed with this one because it, it, nobody does the the old flying head scissors like it used to be done with by the baby faces, the sideways and up, and the old Ricky Gibson. It, they all do the Hurricane Ranas now, and it, I don't know what fuck Sting thought that it was supposed to look like, but anyway. Uh, I like the idea they announced the standby matches because they got 45 minutes left of television broadcast time. People know that. So if this match ends early, we've got standby matches. Uh, I think Sting and Flair still have the most photogenic press slam ever. It just looked great when they did it. But if you go back and look at this match, they kept the people's fucking attention. It was ebbing and flowing. Flair was getting weaker and sting was getting stronger it was 20 minutes in almost before they went to the floor and then there was a little dust up out there and then fucking flair ran sting into the railing and then left him and they beat the count back in and left sting to get a breather the the now everybody's trying to do the most dangerous shit possible on the floor and and risk dangerous injury before it was a go out and get a little breather on the floor <laughs> Uh, Flair then really kicks in the heat. He's aggressive. He's vicious. He's standing over him and gripping him in the face and impo- imposing his will. Tommy young, best referee a- ever would add to the heels heat by looking like he was really trying to referee and stop some cheating, which meant it wasn't his fault because he was just a limp dick in the ring. It was the heels fault. Cause he was really overbearing. This referee he was trying his best. They go back out on the floor, but it looks vicious and serious, not stupid and staged. And as I mentioned, less dangerous than what they were doing in the ring. That's the idea. When you go out on the floor, you can take a pissy bump because it's concrete. 
And and people go, oh shit, that's concrete. Anyway, um, at this point during the heat, Flair beat Sting to death, but didn't hit him with shit that nobody could survive. Just one big move over and over. He was gut shotting him. He was hitting him across the back. He was chopping him. He was roughing him up. You got sympathy for Sting being beat the fuck out of, but at the same time, it wasn't ludicrous. Just move, 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 kick out, kick out, kick out. So when Sting finally does sting up and starts coming back on Flair, they were fucking popping. But then Sting flies into the fucking post and Flair goes right back to the heat. Every time almost that Sting would blow a false comeback, as soon as he'd start blowing the false comeback, Flair would take a few bumps and then Flair wouldn't stop him, but he would have Sting stop himself, fly into the post, fly over the top as Flair ducks, whatever. It's a very subtle thing, but it's all about making the challenger get closer and closer as the match goes on. 30 minutes in, Flair starts working the leg. Now the Greensboro crowd instantly knows what he's going to try for the figure four because people were educated by repetition over and over of these things happening. So they knew what was going on. That helped. You don't get a fucking, you don't tease you're going to fucking work a guy's leg when you've never worked a guy's leg before on this promotion's television, but suddenly you're, oh shit, he's working the leg. Finally, Flair gets the figure four and he works on it for a long time and a long time. And finally, that when Sting is trying to come back, suddenly... He called that spot. He told me one time, he said, I just looked at him. I said, fuck it, beat your chest. And Sting starts beating the chest while he's in the figure four and Flair has that shit look on his face and Sting turns the figure four over and the place goes legitimately mental. And the only reason they didn't stay mental even longer was because once Sting turned it over, since he'd never done that before, he didn't know how to work it. So he just laid there <laughs> and Sting te or Flair tells Tommy Young, untie me, get me out of here. <laughs> but uh, a hold brought the house down. Then Flair goes back to the heat. He's calling a roller coaster. It's not going to be that easy for this kid. But at this point, he can't stay on top of Sting for 30 seconds or 45 seconds before Sting starts fighting back. He's Sting's getting stronger. Flair's getting weaker. Sting gets the figure four. They fucking love it. Flair's selling off the charts for this thing, screaming and paying. Oh, God, he's screaming, sweat's flying. And by the last few minutes of the match, Flair's desperate. Sting's kicking his ass all over ringside. Sting's invincible. Flair's bleeding slightly. They never called the blood again. Um, Sting goes for that stinger splash, and I don't think he meant to. I'm pretty sure he didn't mean to, but he went so high, he just went all the way over the fucking top when Flair moved. And that looked good. But by now they're down to three minutes and they're going back. And in the last three minutes, they did three big false finishes <clears throat> that they built to and it made sense and they registered afterwards. And then Flair, by that point, the last minute, he's just telling Sting, don't sell anything. He's kicking him. He's punching him. Sting's bowing up. And finally... 30 seconds left. Sting hits the stinger splash and puts the scorpion on him. Can Flair hang on? 25 seconds. Oh, my God. The people are screaming, can he do it? Can he do it? They knew by that point he wasn't going to do it, but they were just loving it. And the time expires with Sting with the submission hold on the world champion. But ding, ding, ding. Sting is up in the corner and Flair's face down in the middle of the ring, and we've just made a new babyface superstar. Couldn't bell to bell. That was as good as Sting could be at that point in his life. And they go to break and they come back for the judging and it all falls to shit again because obviously the penthouse pet votes for Ric Flair. <laughs> Gary Jester votes for Sting because he's got to go back to the people in Baltimore and Sandy Scott, because he was a grumpy old fucker and he didn't care about taking the heat. He called it the draw and the people booed and there was no vote for Jason Hervey or Eddie Haskell even though people were standing around going, well, what do you got to say? Horrible stipulation with the judges, horrible execution of the judging, but one of the most famous wrestling matches in the history of television. A star-making performance. And uh, 
you just there's nobody that can do these things anymore. I, there's no fans that can watch them because now that they've seen this other shit, you can't look at it the same way. And there's there's no wrestlers that can perpetrate it. Well, that's what I'm thinking, too. You know, to our earlier discussion about Luger and how good he got in 88, 89, 90, just a few years into the business. Same thing with Sting. You know, they started probably right around the same time Sting was wrestling 1985. Yeah, well, I remember we just told a story here on one of these shows lately where I saw Sting and Warrior together in Louisville at Christmas of 85. And Sting, the only reason Sting wasn't the worst wrestler I'd ever seen is because he was standing next to the Ultimate Warrior. Um, And two years and four months later, he goes 45 minutes on national television in the highest rated cable wrestling match of all time against the best worker in the business and carries his end of it. And it says something about the talent in the wrestling business and... Bill Watts' UWF and Jim Crockett promotions in this period of time that you could take a guy that initially is just a big steroid guy, can't move, can't do too much, but he's in there with the right people. He's in there with Ted DiBiase. He's in there with Ric Flair here. And obviously he has the aptitude to learn or do something different. I mean, Ultimate Warrior went a completely different direction. Well, and that's one thing you said, well, take a big steroid guy. I'm sure Sting had probably taken some supplements, and I'm not indicting him for that. He was a bodybuilder in those days. But Sting was never just a big steroid guy. When Ultimate he first Warrior. Started, no, when he first started, and he well, was teaming with the Ultimate Warrior, he was much and, bigger and, then. And he was bigger then, but here's the he was always an athlete. It The athletic part of him was hidden because of the extra weight. The Ultimate Warrior was never an athlete. He was not coordinated. He was not as athletic. He had no cardio. He never did anything in a wrestling ring that would cause anybody who knows what they're talking about to say he was an athlete. Sting was a fucking athlete. Warrior got even bigger and more clownish looking and more incoherent to go work for Vince, and Sting studied from the guys he was in the ring with, dropped weights so that he could move, and those leapfrogs and drop kicks and stinger splashes. And so he he was a... He may have played the part of a big steroid guy at one time, but there was more to Sting than that. That's all Ultimate Warrior ever was. Right, and so, I wasn't saying you know, that as an indictment of Sting. I was, know, but I'm just saying, you know, you take the big steroid guy. Well, he, had, you know, he he did a lot for himself there, but he he was just so much more athletic, and at that size and that build that he had here to be able to do those athletic things was amazing. Well, here's the other thing to think about. You know, I don't know how many guys today could start and within two and a half years, three years, be ready for a main event roster spot, not blow it. But Luger and Sting, I mean, unless I'm wrong, they weren't even wrestling fans. They were recruited no. into the business based on look, and they figured it out because of who they were working with. I mean, it really is remarkable when you think about it. I mean, the Road Warriors too, even though that's a little different, these guys that weren't wrestling fans, like so many guys, I mean, today, everyone who's a wrestler grew up a wrestling fan, pretty much. Not everyone, but you know what I mean. Back then, there were guys who had no interest in wrestling and got into it because they needed a job, and they figured out how to make it work. It really is astounding. Yeah. Well, and and back then, to be honest, we always we looked down at those guys that were never fans of the business because they didn't know how that it was supposed to look, and you had to lead them and explain it to them, and the learning curve was harder. But now... The guys that get in the business that have been wrestling fans, they're the ones with all the bad habits that you it's too late to break. They don't know what this shit's supposed to look like. They know what it looks like now. So if you get somebody that really has not been a wrestling fan and is a great athlete, you could actually train them and have a better chance of coming out with a an accomplished pro wrestler than with these fucking guys that are watching what they think wrestling is supposed to be because you can't break those bad habits. Anyway, that's basically the situation that launched Sting's full-time main event spot level major league wrestling career there. And, you know, it would end up being, you know, Flair, Sting, and Luger until the mid-90s would be synonymous with the top guys in the company. But it was all back to to this match on that particular tv special but we've saved the best for last brian <laughs> that's right i will I'll, I'll preface this and then we'll we'll sync everything up we'll tell everybody how but basically i've told part of this story before the idea to bring bobby fulton and tommy rogers the fantastics into 
Charlotte was mine because at that time we had gone through some substandard programs, me and the Midnight. The new breed had a car accident. Nikita quit the business. Uh, we were working a little bit with Nikita and Dusty, but he quit the business. His wife got sick and he had taken that time off and just a bunch of shit had not coalesced for us in about six months. And, and we knew we needed to get back in the picture, being able to do what we can do, which is tear the house down, having a match and a baby face team that we can get some sympathy on and get some heat over. And Bobby and Tommy were, I believe in Dallas at that time, which was really in bad shape business wise. And I'd call Bobby. I said, if I can get you here, will you come? And he, of course. So I sat down with Dusty and I made the big pitch. I said, these guys are the best baby face team in the ring in the business. It's the closest we can get to recreating the magic with the rock and roll express. Um, here's an idea for how we can bring them in and make a blah, blah, blah. And he went for it. And my thought was that we would do the first match, the midnight express with the United States tag team champions. We'd beaten everybody and blah, 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 and done all this and that. So we'll just take on the fantastics in a match on syndicated TV, a new tag team coming in, blah, blah, blah. It's a non-title match because since they haven't been in the NWA before, obviously they wouldn't be in line for a United States tag team title match. And we put them over. That was on the first syndicated television program that we did with them. Be they beat us by using our own rocket launcher finish against us. Non-title, but holy shit. And the people, as you remember, they went fucking, wasn't that in Norfolk, Virginia? I believe it was. They went nuts. So then... We come back, the Clash of Champions. And this is all in the first couple of weeks the Fantastics had been in the territory. And we hadn't even started working with them in the house shows yet. But I also knew that while we needed to give the Fantastics credibility, if they beat the Midnight Express one, two, three with our own fucking move, uh, clean in the middle of the ring, then that means the fans know that they're supposed to take them seriously. But that also means that they got the last word on us. There's no reason to, to buy a ticket to see the matches at the house shows or give a fuck because we didn't do anything to Fantastics. So in this match where they get a U.S. tag title match because they've beaten the champions a week or two before, this time we got to end up with heat. It was Dusty's finish. The previous, the syndication match was mine. This was Dusty's finish, but that's all he gave us was the finish. He wanted to do the two referee thing. He wanted to tease that the Fantastics had won the belts, but then we, the, the, that gets reversed and we get some heat on them. I was never a fan of the second referee finish after Eddie Graham did it the first time and it worked in the 60s. <laughs> because it, it can't plausibly happen on a regular basis that this same quirk of fate keeps happening, but it was overdone. Uh, but as okay, we got the double referee thing, but we're going to, you know, certainly we'll tear the house down with everything else. And that's when, besides getting there and being surprised by Eddie Haskell, we got there and they told us because of the long match in the main event, because of the television time constraints, eight minutes for the match. That would mean 10 minutes with entrances in and out. Right. And we were, I was dumbfounded because we never had big show matches that short. And this was, I was still learning the peculiarities of live television, etc. We never had house show matches that short. We never had big show matches that short. Our thing with the Fantastics, the way this was going to get over, was that we go out and have the great tag team matches. And Bobby and Tommy's teamwork was so good. And they had great double team moves. And so did we. And we would shine the baby faces with all this action. And then we'd get heat on them and make them sell and get sympathy on them. It's hard to do that that quick. So we we didn't have a match planned. You didn't do that back then. But we obviously, because we'd worked together so many times, so many different places, we had shit we were planning to do. Eight minutes with an angle afterwards. Eight, ten minutes for introductions, entrances, match, and angle afterwards. Ah, uh, fuck. So we went back and sat down, and I said, the only way we can do this is just to go back to Memphis. And if we're going to give them 10 minutes, it's going to be the goddamnedest 10 minutes they've ever seen in their life. And there's no reason for a baby face, hot baby faces to hit the ring and jump started because they beat us in the only time that we've met. 
so they wanted me in the ring to introduce the midnight coming out of break because we're the recognized team that'll snag them and then the fantastics to come out second i said why wouldn't we jump them before they got their feet under them let the heels jump start it and, and because we're pissed that we got beat but then the baby faces turn the fucking tables and then it's a schmoz and we're in fucking memphis and we went in with okay we're gonna we're gonna go crazy we're gonna brawl uh, then we're, we're, we kept a, a spot that I'd been intending to do in a regular match that we'll talk about when we see it, where Bobby and Tommy come out from the, uh, defensive end and shoot Bobby and Stan off and they do the double upside downs. That's a match that or a spot that I was thinking about. We'd do in a match that I thought we might have. Um, we had a heat spot, which was the double goozle on Tommy Rogers. That'll start the real heat. And then we had our finish, which was a false tag. And with Bobby Fulton drawing the referee, telling him to get out, that we would triple up on Tommy Rogers and Bobby would just lose his fucking mind and throw the referee over the top rope and attack us. And then the Fantastics would come out on top with the rocket launcher again. Second referee would slide in one, two, three and count it. People would think they were the new champions, but the first referee would come back in, take the belts away, call the DQ, and then we get some heat. That's what we had down in our minds to do for this match that we're about to look at, and we figured the rest of it will all take place as it happens. <clears throat> and that's pretty much what we did, and we had the misfortune of being underneath the match of the year because we got fucking runner up match of the year on the same fucking show. And what was the observer and Matt watch and all those different places that people voted back then, because this was different. It was not only was it a different midnight express match. It was a different kind of match. Most of the NWA matches weren't exactly like this. This was good old fashioned Memphis wild shit. And it that type of th stuff wasn't called because you couldn't call it because you didn't really know what was going to happen until you got out there. So we used to just say, that's what Lawler would give a match. The first 10 minutes of the match, he'd just say, just wild. <laughs> and 10 minutes later, now get some heat. That was the instruction you got, wild. Just be wild. I'm sure there's something that I can't think of right now, but off the top of my head, I think this may have been like the wildest match anyone would have seen on TV. I mean, you didn't have matches like this on TV where it well, was no. just a brawl around ringside. I mean, now it's commonplace. And I think it's important to reinforce that because someone who wasn't around back then or hasn't really gone through any of that old footage, they may think, oh, tag team wrestling was like this, just wild brawls. There was nothing like this on TV on WWF or NWA TV at the time. No, because uh, even if you had a main event match on free television which was still rare in those days it was done as an as an angle or to increase interest or whatever and but you still <laughs> only in memphis did they just say fuck it you know that was a, it was a memphis main event we're just gonna tear shit we're gonna rattle furniture around tear shit up no you did not see uh main event level matches much less wild brawls on free television in those days and so this was especially, holy shit, but it was different also than the other NWA matches because Crockett promotions in the seventies, you know, they had been even more conservative in the seventies Crockett's house shows. Uh, first match was always a 20 minute Broadway because that got the people in their seats. Cause they're running big buildings. They got thousands of people to sit down. Nothing before intermission was allowed to have any contact on the floor with each other whatsoever. No fighting on the floor before intermission. Uh, a lot of stri strict rules because they were concentrating on building their main events and their money matches. When Dusty took the book, he loosened things up considerably and brought more of a Florida fl flavor into things. But still, here's another thing I guess I should mention before we watch this. Not a goddamn person had a clue we were going to do any of this. We went out and did it on our own. And Bobby and Tommy were kind of shitting because they'd only been there for two weeks. But we said, look, we'll take the fucking heat. We're going to do this. We're going to use some shit because we're going to give them 10 goddamn minutes they're going to remember, and we're going to break some shit to do it. But if it sucks, we'll take the heat, and we're going to get yelled at. It's not your fault. You're the new guys. And if it's good, nobody's going to say anything to us because it was so fucking good. 
We did not get any heat. But anyway, what do you think Tully and Arn were thinking watching this, knowing they have to have a big match later in the show? They were thinking those motherfuckers, they got to go on first. <laughs> well, and all, but also, but they had Barry Windham and Lex Luger, two big main event. And I'm not even talking about quality of talent between the Fantastics and Windham and Luger. I'm talking about two guys recognized with track records as main event stars. And we have two baby faces that the people in North Carolina have seen once on television. <clears throat> so we needed a little fucking pick me up. Uh, they had some, and also theirs was the world tag title. I was just, ours was just the United States tag title and they got a little bit more time. So everything worked out and they tore the house down too. Anyway, how are we going to tell the people how to set this thing up? Okay. A few different things. Obviously, go to the WWE Network if you are a subscriber and go to Clash of the Champions 1. Once you are there, you can go to the timestamp 1551. 15 minutes and 51 seconds into the broadcast. Pause it, and we will begin at that point. An easier way, if you have the option underneath the video player, to jump to a specific segment. Obviously, just click the one that says Midnight Express versus Fantastics. U.S. tag titles, it will take you right to this point, 1551. Jim, having, or, <laughs> I was about to say, having said that, are you ready? All right, Jim, well, if we're ready to go, what we're going to do is we're going to count down from five, we're going to say one, and then after one, click play. <laughs> what, is it three or after the one, two, three, go, or one, two, go on three? Exactly. That's the problem yeah. I'm anticipating everyone out yeah. there having. So right now, 1551 is the time Clash of the Champions won in five, four, three, two, one, press play. Boom. And there's my lovely face. That's what the viewers came back to. Uh, actually, they came back to a one second shot of the Cornet for President banner, which they apparently edited out here. I don't know. Anyway. I hate that middle aisle. Look, no people. That's the first time they used it for TV and had the barricades back. It was great for people not attacking you, but it was an empty fucking blotch when you looked at it from the hard camera. I just, I didn't like that. Anyway, you notice the Midnight Express introduced and in the ring in 45 seconds. We ain't wasting any time. Hello to the girl in the red. I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, wish I could remember what her name was. Anyway, Pee Wee Anderson, the referee, Pee Wee was the one who famously ripped his shirt off and did Hulk Hogan poses on the uh, bar of the lighthouse in Alexandria when Dr. Death and Hercules Hernandez beat the whole bar up. Here comes Bobby and Tommy. There's a Bobby ear, ear tug to say hello to his girlfriend right there. There we go. <clears throat> and now, boom, less than a minute and a half in. Here we go. Ding, ding. Tom Miller didn't know this was going to happen, and he can't get the fuck out of there. <laughs> We told nobody what we were going to do. We just said, fuck it. Here we go. But the people were into it because they'd seen the TV. They knew what the fuck. They knew we were mad. Um, I love this part here. Stan takes his own post. <laughs> 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 They're calling us as they go. And I want Bobby's rolling concrete bumps. Boom. And coming up here to say Bobby's Bobby Eaton too many Bobby's Bobby Eaton's trying to tell Bobby Fulton just stop duck there we go boom shit oh and watch this in the middle of this craziness here in a second Stan and Tommy Rogers are going to do a drop down hip toss leapfrog right and Stan loved that in the middle of goddamn brawl he's doing drop down leapfrogs it, it, it you just had to keep the shit moving and Poor uh, Pee Wee trying to take control of shit. Now watch this. Bobby wanted to do something here. Bobby Eaton did, and they wouldn't settle down and listen to him. He's trying to gouge everybody's eyes, and finally he just says, fuck it. I'll go out here. I told Stan, I said, uh, I'm calling for a chair spot. I said, run him into the fucking chair. While the Bobbies are throwing the table around. Here we go. Tommy Rogers head first in the chair. The photographers are running. I mean, I guess we are used to it. And plus, you know, I started in Memphis, but you're right. Nobody was doing this shit on TV back then. Nobody. 
And it's not like everybody was cooperating to try to build this erector set of, you know, tables and chairs and ladders to climb onto. We're just hitting people with blunt instruments as they happen by. How dangerous is that table with the legs up? Uh, well, it wasn't supposed to be there that way, and we didn't have time to worry about it. It'll come back into play in a second. Bobby Fulton also was not happy when, when he caught one of those chairs that cut his palm of his hand. Anyway, now you see this, boom, where are they going here? I'm pretty sure coming up, we're going into, ah, yes, the blind tag. Boom, there's the blind tag, hand to hand by the Fantastics, behind Bobby's back. Uh-oh, that was a spot actually I'd come up with we were going to do in the original tag match, and it still made it. But yeah, coming up into the double upside down. Bobby Eaton hated this. He hadn't done this bump in five years, and he missed it. He didn't quite hang it. Stan got his. Um, but once again, the people are, oh shit. Cause there are people flying everywhere and it looks like a fight. You don't have to stop and cooperate. Um, here just in a couple of seconds, I believe is where, yeah, I remember I've told you I was wearing a watch, so I was keeping time and right here in a second, I'm going to buzz the boys. It's time for the heat spot which we knew was the double goozle on Tommy. I think, yeah, as a matter of fact, I just told Stan, uh, yeah, I'm telling Stan, eh, time for the heat. Covering your mouth with the racket. Yes. <laughs> Stan buzzed Bobby. Let's get to heat. Here we go. Tag. Reversal. Rogers doesn't know the other guy's legal double goozle. Boom. Now we've changed the tide. Now we have, uh, we're in this so far for less than five minutes. We've got to get some fucking heat. And you can listen to the fans during the time they were getting the heat on Tommy, every time he would fucking fire up or throw a punch or fight back or show some life, they were into it with him. We didn't give him time to stop and fucking dwell on what else was going on in the world. They were in this moment. Um, I, here's this kick. Tommy Rogers was the right height and his selling was so good. It's the best Stan Lane's kicks ever looked. And well, no, I'm seriously, it, it takes, it takes yeah. both. It takes both people. And plus Tommy was, he would go up like a feather on a slam. Tommy Rogers. I could slam him. I looked like Harley race. I tried to pick up Bobby Fulton. He felt like happy Humphrey. And now boom, Bobby decides about this time. Oh, I've just told Stan draw the referee because I told Bobby when he was on the apron, next time you get in, throw Tommy into the table. Boom. There's the table spot. <laughs> the table was laying there. I've never seen anyone else do that spot. Never okay. Well, it was, it was laying there and I, what the fuck? So I told Stan, get in and draw the referee. I told Bobby while he was on the apron, the next time you jump in, just throw Tommy in the table. The funny part was Bobby had, had picked Tommy Rogers up and said, watch the table. And Tommy said, what table? And he told me <laughs> later, all of a sudden, he saw this table rising up like out of, a, out of the fucking ground. And he ran into it. Boom. But that's when, when you're calling something, that's what you say. You're going to punch somebody, watch the fist. You're going to shoot somebody off for an elbow, watch the elbow. Watch the table. And watch this. This is fucking beautiful. Boom, Bobby, power slam. Boom, and it hurt him, and he couldn't capitalize. Oh, but now he gets over. Oh, is he going to cover? No, he's not. He's going to the top. <clears throat> Bobby's just realized he hadn't come off the top yet. You got to get one of those in. We're rushing. I admit we're rushing. And now it's when he's hurt himself and he couldn't cover. And he makes the tag out. Tommy Rogers is great at selling. Oh my God. And just the body language and the limp raggedness. Um, nice side salto. And then, Stan wants to draw Bobby in one more time. And I think coming up here shortly, we may be getting into the, uh, Oh no, it's still a couple minutes yet before we get into the bad part the Tommy, the worst part of Tommy's night. But see now they're, they're being vicious. They're gouging his eyes. They're beating him up. They're cutting the ring off. Stan on the fly called something. So Bobby said, instead of coming back in, I'll come off here. Boom. Done. Do you see any obvious mistakes? Do you see anybody standing around waiting, trying to figure out what to fucking do? And they don't know what, this is the big part. They're not trying to stand around, standing around figuring out what to do because they don't know what they're going to do next until they do it. <clears throat> Can you imagine trying to remember all this shit and make it look natural? 
Just go with the fucking flow. Look at Bobby or Tommy firing back. Listen to the people. And then watch these fucking shots. Boom. It's not a UFC punch, but you can't tell it's bullshit. I hate that wide shot. I believe I've mentioned that big empty area where there should be people on the floor. And once again, Stan just said sunset flip. But Bobby, the referee was with Bobby Fulton. So Bobby Eaton gets a chance to fuck. It's a hope spot. Simple as that. Doesn't require a lot of advanced pre-planning. Now we're coming up on the part. Stan goes to tag Bobby. Bobby says, no, dump him out. Stan says, okay. Stan's going to dump him out on the floor. Did you see me just look at my watch? I'm saying, we barely got any time left. You actually saw me show Bobby the wrist. <laughs> <clears throat> now, referee's backing Bobby Fulton up. Bobby Eaton has seen this. Why not? It's a flat table. E boom, flat slam. Holy shit, you don't see that every day, and it was jarring. And that's, you know, now I've told Bobby, I said, we we got to be going any old time now, right? And as, as a matter of fact, I think I'm passing that word on. I said, don't worry, we're going right there when I was over the top of the announce desk. What we didn't realize was that Bobby is going to add this one little thing that's going to cost us an extra minute. Bobby decides he wants to bulldog Tommy Rogers on the table. Now the shot is the shits, but he bulldogs Tommy Rogers on the table. Bobby Eaton's weight hit one side and it flipped the other side up. So instead of going flat, look at there's concern. Instead of going flat, the side of Tommy's face blasted into the table that was flipping up. It deviated his septum. It, I don't know if it broke his nose or just dislocated it. And his eye uh, started swelling up and he's starting to go blind. Bobby's still saying hello to his girlfriend, <laughs> but Tommy Rogers is telling him, that he doesn't know what fucking time it is right now. And Pee Wee's trying to say, get back to the corner. We got it. Pee Wee's saying, go home, go home. Bobby Fulton's saying, we're going to. And Tommy Rogers is saying, what time does the bus get here? Because he doesn't know what the fuck's going on. We're losing a minute. Finally, we determined that Tommy can continue. Actually, we didn't determine that. He just crawled back close enough we could get him. Tommy Rogers at this point actually cannot see. He's blind. The optic nerve has been pressed on. And Stan says, watch this. Drop toe hold elbow. And Tommy says, "I." what Stan said first said, are you okay? And Tommy said, I can't see. And then Stan said, drop toe hold elbow and just held on to him all the way to the ropes and back. So Tommy couldn't see where he was going, but he didn't have to. And now Bobby's like, all right, can, can we get through with this? And uh, there's a little more vamping. And then finally say, okay, we, we can do this. We're going to get it. Just fire up. Boom, boom, boom. Block, shot on Stan. Dive over, makes the tag, but the referee doesn't see it. And Tommy's like, thank God this shit's almost over. Fucking here's the, the triple team behind the referee's back. Bobby Fulton throws Pee Wee over the top and says, fuck it, I'm going to take matters in my own hands. Here was just a little nod to boom, a racket shot so I can take the bump. And this sets up the rocket launcher in the perfect place. And Bobby trying to fucking get up back down in the right position, right in the nick of time. Second referee, Tommy Young. And listen to that crowd. Tommy Rogers still can't figure out where the fuck he's at. When he went back in the locker room and blew his nose, both of his eyes swelled up shut completely with blood. And he had to take, I forget whether it was a week off or what the fuck it was, but his whole goddamn face was fucked. And there he's supposed to go into the post, but he didn't get it good. So he told Stan, he said, give it to me again. Okay. Whoop, into the post. Now we've got poor Bobby Fulton. Well, further than Pee Wee was not happy about that one. Um, we're, we're over time now. We've been out here for, tw this has only been thir not even 13 minutes. Bobby hurt his fucking wrist on that because he we rushed it and he put his hands down instead of taking them on his forearms. But here's the meat of the matter. This is going to end up in June at the Great Amer July at the Great American Bash with the Fantastics whipping me. But this is March, and we're going to whip the shit out of him. And I apologize to Bobby beforehand, but he was screaming, Tommy, Tommy, 
Tommy, anybody help me. <laughs> you really want to count the, on and, him. Until poor Tommy comes in with the fucking chair and still <laughs> practically beat to death. And then one, Tommy Young will not let me forget about this one to this day. Corny, God damn it. Um, and that's how you, in less than 13 minutes, tear the fucking Greensboro Coliseum apart. And nobody yelled at us because it was good. Except Pee Wee saw the steps down there at the nick of time and didn't take a very good bump. I hate middle, middle stairs as well because that's an injury looking to happen. Nice looking racket shot. Decent bump for the fucking fat manager. And there you have it. Well, your winners, and that, the Midnight Express by disqualification. By disqualification. And then that led to the match that we had in May in, I believe it was May or maybe late April in Chattanooga at the UTC Arena where we had that third in the trilogy that everybody makes over where we went the whole hour on syndicated television and they did beat us after a teased referee stoppage and did win the fucking match. And that when Bobby Eaton had 102 degree fever and had been throwing up all day and Bobby Fulton lost some fucking, I think he was, he was juiced in that one. Wasn't he? He lost some blood. Anyway, this was my favorite match out of the bunch because we overachieved with the spot that we were given. But, uh, the other two were better tag team wrestling matches, in my opinion. And there you have it. 